everyone, welcome to this week's Future Science and Technology News. Now, I am Matthew Griffin, I'm a futurist, I look up to 50 years out, I scan over 600 exponential and emerging technologies, hundreds of trends, and actually this means that we can see the future literally being formed and created and shaped today. So let's get through the news. Right, now, uh, this is my exponents blog, so you can find this on my fanaticalfuturist.com website. So these are all the latest things that I've been seeing this week and a little bit of last, so we'll go backwards in order because, hey, why not? Now, well, when we actually have a look at um, hallucinations, we all know that a lot of the large frontier artificial intelligence models like Anthropic, like ChatGPT, GPT-4, GPT-4.0, uh, Google Gemini, and so on and so forth, have a tendency to hallucinate. Now, in traditional human terms, we actually say that they're just getting stuff wrong. And if we really want to be slightly confrontational about it, we just say they're making shit up. Now, um, one of these problems basically means that as you use these artificial intelligence models, basically you can't really be guaranteed that the output that you're getting is factually correct or anywhere near being factually correct. Now, I write lots and lots of books. Um, I've got a codex basically which has hundreds of trends in which you can download from the 311institute.com website. And any time I've been using artificial intelligence to try to dig up facts and statistics on trends, for example, things like geopolitical fragmentation, lots of fun stuff there, it gets the vast majority of it wrong, which means I still end up doing everything manually and checking everything by hand. However, this latest breakthrough, basically from the University of Oxford, might help me in the future and you in the future as well. Now. This one is a little bit complicated to explain, but what they've basically done in this is the University of Oxford researchers have created a brand new checking algorithm. Now, what they've actually done is they've used something called semantic entropy. Um, the only way to really describe this is if I said to you all, what is the, Par what is the capital of France, you will say, Paris. You know, some of you might say Paris, some of you might say the capital of France is Paris, uh, the French capital is Paris, etc, etc. And we know basically that all of those particular answers are correct. Now if someone says the capital of France is Rome, we know that that's not correct. So what these researchers have actually done is they've clumped all of the correct answers together and they've clumped wrong answers, things that are factually incorrect, in another group. So this is where the idea of entropy actually comes in. So when you ask the chatbot, what is the capital of France? Instantly, this algorithm is, on the one hand, listening to and reading what the chatbot is outputting. But secondly, it's trying to understand the context of what is being said. And then it applies what is being said and the answer to the group of correct answers that it has kind of in its memory banks. And it sort of says, yeah, this is kind of right because you know the answer that I've generated aligns basically with all of these different answers of Paris being the capital of France. Okay, so that is literally the simplest and most straightforward way I can actually put this. Um, it seems to be about 80% accurate. I think that there's still a lot more work to be done basically when we talk about trying to ensure that AIs don't hallucinate. And actually Sam Altman himself has actually said he doesn't think AIs will never not hallucinate and he doesn't think they'll actually fix the problem. Because it's not just a problem of this or last year, it's actually a decades old problem. So uh, now when we actually have a look at the cost of, uh, tra of training these frontier artificial intelligence models, that's just plain laughable. Um, some of the latest artificial intelligence large language models, for example, have cost around $200 million basically to actually train in terms of compute time. Now that's excluding the fact that in some cases, organizations like Meta have bought $10 billion worth of NVIDIA GPUs basically to create GPU clusters and AI factories that in some cases are anywhere between 100,000 and 300,000 GPUs all clustered together. Um, so ironically, basically, when we actually have a look at another article that I wrote a little while ago, Anthropic's CEO, they make Claude and Claude 3, the AI, 
Uh, he thinks basically that eventually it could cost a hundred billion dollars to actually train things like artificial in gen artificial general intelligence models and ASI models. And he already says that he sees companies that are now starting to create models that will cost one billion dollars to train. But set against that, what we see is we see a habit in the West of creating continuously larger artificial intelligence models that obviously cost more in terms of compute to train. Whereas in China, they're trying to create more efficient artificial intelligence models, mainly because they can't get access to GPUs because uh, those are under sanctions at the moment. So ironically, I think if the West continues this desire to create increasingly large models and create large models over efficient models, and some of the efficient models that we're seeing coming through now are called small language models, then we're going to lose out to China. Uh, because ultimately, the end goal is to create artificial intelligence models that are able to run effectively on end devices with minimal compute, min minimal energy and water footprints and all that kind of stuff. See, so um, now, ironically, again, talking about China, um, when we have a look at some of the latest statistics out of China, it's estimated that China is leading the world in around 90% of emerging technology research, but also emerging technology field research. You know, so a technology is AI, a field is the use of artificial intelligence in, uh, for example, precision agriculture, that kind of thing. Now, as China continues to produce around 350,000 computer science graduates every year, as, long, as well as a lot of other researchers and scientists, the fact of the matter is there aren't enough regional companies to actually hire them all. So ironically, while China is outpacing the rest of the world in, shall we say, emerging technology and field research, um, especially via the Chinese Academy of Sciences, we're seeing organizations like Volkswagen, Microsoft and others proactively hiring researchers in China and at using China, Chinese researchers as their effective R&D labs which is, as I say, ironic. Uh, now, as we start dropping down, so August 20th, uh, Grox Ultrafast LPU. Now, when we actually have a look at a lot of the inference, so that's AI training, and a lot of the queries that you actually task artificial intelligences with responding to, the fact of the matter is, at the moment, they generally go to NVIDIA GPU clusters, like I mentioned before. However, this company, Grok, um, which is not the same as Elon Musk's artificial intelligence, uh, has produced something called a, large, a language processor unit. Now, the team behind the LPU is actually the team behind the tensor processing unit, the TPU, which Google famously uses basically to train all their artificial intelligence models. And this particular LPU is not only 18 times faster than the latest state-of-the-art sort of H100, B200 uh, NVIDIA GPUs, but it is also 18 times more energy efficient. So this is one to watch. Uh, the company recently hit a market valuation of $3.4 billion. However, I think one of the problems that they're going to see, a little bit like we saw with GraphCore, which were creating neural processing units out of Bristol in the UK, is they won't be able to get traction fast enough, they won't be able to get enough investment, and they could either end up getting bought or they end up, could end up sort of fizzling away. That's my worry there. Um, now, when we actually have a look at uh, these large artificial intelligence companies quite literally stealing our information and then using our information that people like I actually created to train their AI models, the person who, well, the guy basically who invented the internet's business model, aka the advertising business model for the internet, a chap called Bill Gross, you really have to thank him, don't you, for that business model, has now thought up a, for a new business model, but for artificial intelligence. So this one's quite interesting, I think it's got legs. Um, now, this new business model basically for artificial intelligence is rather than stealing data um, or using data that companies haven't paid for, or using other artificial intelligence services. He actually thinks basically that using AI as a pay-as-you-go service is quite interesting. 
uh, as well as data as you go service. So he's already got organizations like Universal signed up to it and all sorts of stuff. So essentially what he's trying to do is he's trying to create a business model for artificial intelligence that he believes actually works basically for the artificial intelligence community as well as us consumers as well as the companies basically whose data is being mined. Um, now when we have a look at India one of the things that we've actually seen around the world is recently we saw a 125% increase in the number of cyber attacks around the world that's only going one way and that means that in India along the lines of Russia, the UK, the USA, Japan as well as obviously China with the Great Firewall of China people in India are starting to consider whether or not India needs its own sovereign internet. Now what we mean by a sovereign internet is a is a country's internet that you can just disconnect from the broader world wide web you know you flick a switch and suddenly everyone that is attacking you from outside of india can't get access russia a little while ago but they actually managed to turn off access to its sovereign internet in an experiment about two years ago um, but the problem with that is when you create a sovereign internet, on the one hand, it generally starts operating on different standards, different protocols and everything else. And so the interoperability of different global internets starts suffering. And that increases business costs. Uh, it puts up barriers basically to your partners and all that sort of stuff. So there are pros and cons. However, as we see more and more cyber attacks being levied, especially as we've seen the rise of autonomous artificial intelligence agents that are able to use zero day exploits to cut through pretty much any website or any system basically like a knife through butter. I actually think this is increasingly a better idea more than it's a worse idea. Um, now we've also got uh, this one so something I've been talking about for years the rise of digital humans but when we have a look at digital humans we kind of have a variety of those we have avatars that are photorealistic. We have digital humans, basically that uh, I have one. Uh, I'm gonna show off to some of my uh, clients, basically over the next uh, couple of weeks. Um, we have digital humans that are pre-programmed. Um, and then we have digital humans that have neural network brains that are able to respond to you in natural language, a little bit like a personal assistant would. So Google basically has been trialing Vlogger now they're not the only one, Instagram and Metaverse are also trialing similar technologies. But the idea behind Vlogger is that you can clone yourself as a YouTube influencer and you can use that clone of yourself to create lots and lots of different videos but also engage basically with your fans in new and exciting and varied ways. Um, we've got this, now I actually think this is just brilliant. Um, in my background, I used to work for EMC. I ran global business units at IBM and Atos, who recently ran the Olympics IT. And when you're made redundant or when you're looking at changing jobs for whatever reason it happens to be, we have all been there. We have all basically been sitting in front of computer systems and platforms like Brass Ring, where you have to keep repeating over and over and over again your CV, your experience, why you for the job and everything else. Now, when we actually have a look at hiring today, the vast majority of companies that you send your CVs to actually use artificial intelligence to mine the data from your CV, filter it, and then they actually say, interview this guy, don't interview this guy. Um, so HR teams have been using artificial intelligence to filter us out for a very long time. But now we can get an artificial intelligence bot. We put in our details, you know, our CV, our skills, our strengths, our weaknesses, if we want to go there. And this bot will go on to platforms like LinkedIn, Indeed, and so on and so forth, and automatically complete thousands of job applications on your behalf while you sleep. Now, some HR teams absolutely hate it, Others kind of love it because they are actually seeing you, know, you apply anyway. Now the guy who actually created this, it's called Lazy Apply. Uh, it, this, the bot ended up filling in about 3,000 applications overnight for him. 
he ended up getting 20 interview requests. So the success rate was something like 0.01%. Um, normally, if you're a human, you'd be filling in about 200 to 300 applications yourself with a similarly kind of dismal success rate. Um, but this lets you catch up on your sleep, so you're fresh for the interview. Um, and then when we actually have a look here, we've got, um, and I've seen this in a couple of examples, I've seen this with Claude's Anth with Anthropics Claude artificial intelligence model. Now we've actually managed to reveal it in Apple's artificial intelligence model, their small language model or efficient language model as they are now calling their own sort of AI. Um, We've caught AIs using an internal scratch pad to think. So, for example, if I ask you a question, whatever that question is, you know, what do you want to have for dinner tonight? Um, in your head, you kind of have like this inner voice and you're kind of going through all these different ideas and concepts and visions and everything else. And then eventually you reply to me and say, fish and chips. So we've seen that AIs are using almost the exact same model to think about things as we humans. So that's just amusing. Um, and then last but not least, because I covered the uh, news piece on the, uh, on the AI bootstrapping its own intelligence in the last um, news update that I did, when we have a look at ChatGPT here, um, ChatGPT uh, recently started replying to a red teamer, so a red teamer with an open AI basically is somebody who's testing these artificial intelligences to see whether or not they are, shall we say, market ready. Um, so whether they're hallucinating, whether they are safe, you know, all those kinds of things. And um, using something called an audio prompt injection attack, which in this case was purely accidental, the AI started responding back to this researcher using his own voice. Now, a prompt injection attack is where we use different prompts to try to break the guardrails or to change the behaviors of, an, of a particular artificial intelligence. However, an audio prompt injection attack, and ironically, we saw people actually hacking Alexas many, many years ago by using dolphin noises. That is a thing, go to this website and you can go and actually read up on that. An audio prompt injection attack is where we actually use a sound to jailbreak or break an artificial intelligence. Now, where audio prompt injection attacks get quite interesting is you can hear my voice. As a human, you are tuned to listening to sounds kind of in this range. However, AIs and machines and the speakers that you have on your kitchen tops and all that kind of stuff, they can hear sounds that are incredibly low, very, very low bass sounds, but also almost ultrasonic sounds that you can't hear. Which means that when we actually have a look at the cyber sort of, uh, you know, the, the cyber landscape, using audio prompt injection attacks against, for example, AIs that you might be using at home, uh, let alone in the office, that's a bit of a different situation, means that I can break your AIs and get them to do some rather weird things. So anyway, that is the end of my little update today. Now, what I like to say is I show you the future of everything. There are some people that will show you a thin slice of the future. I like showing you the future of everything. And what I mean by that is I will show you the future of every technology, every trend, every line of business, every sector in every region. And if you've actually liked what you heard, then like and subscribe, all that kind of stuff. You can download a lot of my free books from 311institute.com forward slash insights, where there are about 10,000 pages worth of trends technologies that frankly I would be very surprised if you could actually even imagine that we've already developed and uh, check back in next time. I will be back in about another week's time. Take care and goodbye.